All right, good night and good night. So tonight we're still on the topic of relationships and that type of thing. We are going to be looking at a few examples in the Bible and we're also going to be hopefully trying to clear up some things from last week as well. So let's start with that. So sometimes people think that two things cannot be true at the same time. Okay. And I think that that is where a lot of problems arise because the moment somebody hears the word submission, automatically they think that the person that is submitting is a lower value. They think that the person, in this case, when we're talking about the Bible, females and males in marriage and that type of thing, God says to the women, submit to your husbands. And the moment people hear that, especially in today's day and age, they immediately see that as a negative thing. And immediately they see, okay, the man is going to take advantage of me. The man is going to beat me. The man is going to not give me money. He's going to withhold money from me. He's going to withhold love from me. He can force me to have sex when I don't want to have sex. He's going to do all these negative things to me. Okay, immediately. And that's not what God is saying. Immediately when people hear submit, they think, oh, I got to stay at home all day long and slave over a hot stove and clean the house. And I can't participate in commerce. I can't participate in the outside world. I can't do business. Nobody said that, right? <laughs> God never said that. But immediately when people hear that word submit, they just think the worst things. And I want to clear up. Hopefully, because, you know, some people hear the words that you're saying and they misconstrue your words. They, they hear one part, they don't listen to the full message and, you know. So I just want to make it abundantly clear that God is not against females being educated. I can't find any evidence of that in the Bible. God is not against females participating in markets and commerce and that type of thing. I can't find anything in the Bible that forbids women to participate in business. Okay? In fact, we looked at Proverbs 31 last week and we saw an example of the virtuous woman and we saw her participate in all types of business. The Bible says that she is in trade and she deals with the merchant ships and she deals with a parcel of land. She considereth it and purchases the land. And it speaks about her being involved in farming and all types of different business activities. There's nothing wrong with that. And nobody ever said that there was something wrong with that. Okay. Furthermore, I try to explain that it's not only that God wants females to submit to their husbands, but God Himself is submissive. God himself is humble. He asks all of his disciples to follow in his example of humility. God, the God of the universe, came down here and washed our feet. And they didn't have nice leather shoes that were enclosed with socks. So they take off the shoe and take off the socks and you got to reasonably presentable foot to wash. They didn't have that. <laughs> These guys were walking around in sandals on the dusty streets of Jerusalem and Judea and all that type of thing. Their feet were probably so disgusting, so dirty. God had no problem washing their feet. And then he turned around and he told all of them, listen, I don't want you guys to be proud and arrogant. And when you guys are in positions of authority, and prominence. I don't want you to lord it over the people that you are leading. Okay, I want you to take the opposite approach. I want you to see yourself as the ultimate servant. And I want you to put on humility, put on submissiveness, and I want you to serve everybody. That's what God was telling his disciples. That's what God himself is like. That same passage, Mark chapter 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In other words, he's saying, though I'm the king of kings, though I'm the Lord of lords, 
I am not even coming here for you guys to serve me. I come to serve you and to give my life for you. That is God's spirit. God is humble. He wants his servants to be humble. He wants his disciples, his male disciples to be humble and submissive. And he wants his daughters of Zion to be humble and submissive. It's the general ethos of God. When we're talking about submission, we're merely talking about a order of authority. It doesn't mean that the woman is less. She's not less valuable. She's not less important. She's not less fantastic. All of, She's still great. But all God is saying is, in the chain of command, in the chain of authority, I want you to humbly, voluntarily place your value under the direction and leadership of the man. Okay? It's just like if you're in an army, you've got the general and you've got the sergeants and you've got the lieutenants. The lieutenant may be faster. He may be sharper. He may be, well, he is more than likely younger. He may be talented in certain things, but in the structure of the army, he has to report to the sergeant, okay? We're on the same team. If the two of them out there battling out the enemy forces and one gets hurt, the other is going to run and get the other. We're fighting on the same team. It's just in the order of rank, in the order of command. God says, I put the man on top of the household. That's how I want it to be. And I want you ladies to submit to your husbands. And again, he tells the men, you need to treat your women properly. He tells them that. He says, you have to be willing to die for them. And you have to love them like you love your own self. And furthermore, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, look, if you guys don't treat your wives properly, God is not going to listen to your prayers. Right? So, you've got to listen to the whole council. Right? You've got to listen to the whole council. Now, some people may say, well, they want me to stand home and cook and clean and, and so on and so forth. Like, that's a woman job or what? Okay, look. There's no hard and fast rules saying that women need to stay home and clean only. Yes, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we have the Apostle Paul saying, I would that the ladies stay at home, manage the house, look after the kids, etc. Okay, yes. Generally, by default, that's the default understanding. It only makes sense, and we will look at that in a minute. But there's no hard and fast rule saying that a lady cannot have a child, and then also be working, okay? In fact, in today's economy, that is the norm. In today's society and economy, that is the norm. But I'm just pointing out to you that that norm may not be always the best thing or the most ideal thing. It is usually not the most ideal thing for the children. It is very likely not the ideal thing for the woman. And it is generally not the ideal thing for the entire family. Why do I say so? Because if you interview many women who have had children, if you ask them if they prefer to stay home and raise their children rather than go outside and have to work and to be a breadwinner, okay? If we say to them, if your husband was affluent enough to pay all the bills and to maintain a comfortable lifestyle through his financial income and you did not have to work in order for you to provide for yourself a comfortable life for yourself and your children would you still want to go out to work or would you prefer to be home and to raise the children many many women upon getting that question would say well i would prefer to stay home with the children okay because it means i don't have to bother my head with that boss and this boss and that time and then i'm gonna be rushing here and rushing there and so on I can stay home, I can deal with the children, and I can sort out things. Okay? So, it's not a bad thing. Now, in today's economy, where inflation is rampant, and it often takes two incomes from both the man and the woman to make ends meet, well, 
I can understand a woman saying, well, you know, I got to go out there. But you do that as a, to me, that's a sacrifice because you're putting your child in the hands of a teenager most of the time or some 20 year old with no experience with bad habits. You're putting your child in the hands of untrained people in many cases. Okay, is that ideal? I don't know that that's ideal. Now, I mean, again, there's no hard and fast rule saying what you need to do and what you don't need to do in terms of if a lady should work or if a lady should forsake a second income to make sure that she is able to spend more time at home and to be more watchful and aware and more diligent to manage the household. There's no hard and fast rule. But I put to you, if it is at all possible for the man to be able to make sufficient money to make the whole family comfortable, that a wise, sensible, intelligent woman would do a wonderful job if her focus was to manage the well-being of the family. Okay, so she's not bothered with having to do this work for this boss and write these things for some shoe company and then write these things for some other marketing company. And she's spending eight to nine to 10 hours of the best productive time of her day. All her energy, her focus is there serving some alien cause that has nothing to do with her life, her company, her children, her nothing to do with it. Her best Hours, her best energy is serving some external cause. And then a few teenage girls are doing the inputs into their children. Is that ideal? I don't know that that's ideal. If you have a wise woman, an educated woman who says, okay, my husband has been able to make sufficient money for me not to have to work. What I'm going to do is I'm going to teach my children properly. I can teach them nutrition so that they understand nutrition before they start to get all sorts of bad habits and bad appetites and destroy their lives through sugar and oil and salt. I can teach them nutrition properly. I'm going to teach them about fitness. I'm going to teach them about stretching. I'm going to teach them about the different parts of the body and so on and make sure that they develop the habit of fitness so that throughout their lives, they can be strong and resilient and they can heal easier and all of these different things. I'm going to teach them about history. I'm going to teach them about commerce. I'm going to teach them about English. I can teach them how to write properly, how to express themselves and to articulate themselves. I'll teach them how to present themselves. I'll teach them how to have interpersonal relationships. Me and the children, we're going to go into town. We're going to go into this place. We can travel to this place. And so I'm going to teach them about the world. I'm going to teach them properly. Do you know that the emperors and the kings and these types of people, these high level rulers, the aristocracy, etc., they would have people specifically trained to teach their children in swore fighting and in literature and in music and in arts and in philosophy and all these various disciplines. And that child is a noble child and he's receiving the top grade education. Top grade education. By the time that child is 13, he can articulate himself better than most adults. He is far more learned regarding the mechanisms of the world etc cetera, etc cetera. it is not a me it's not a meaningless valueless enterprise to be the educator of your children that woman can also properly take care of her husband make sure that his appointments are set he got to check his prostate he got to check his teeth and so on he's got to organize these things okay He's got this big opportunity here. Let me make sure that everything that he needs is organized. I got to make sure he is eating properly. I got to make sure that he is getting in his exercise and so on and so forth. And I'm there to encourage him. Make it easy. What is it that you want? How can I help you to perform at your 110%? What can I do to help you to fulfill the vision that you have? That God has given you. God gives a vision to a man. The man is out there doing the vision. 
And here's the wise woman coming alongside the man and saying, okay, what do you need me to do? How can I help? Okay, how can I encourage this process? We're on the same team. I want you to win. I want you to win. Okay, I'm not trying to compete with you and trying to see how much money I can make and how I can shame you or how I can be independent of you or how I could run my own situation just in case you do anything. Well, why would I want to do anything if I got a proper woman dealing with things, an irreplaceable woman? So no one is saying that you need to stay home and raise your children and take care of your husband and make sure that the house is clean and sweet and comfortable and make sure that your husband wants to come home and your children love to come home, right? And when the other children come to play, they big up your house and they understand your house is the house of light. They don't say it in that way, but they recognize when we go over by Auntie Jenny or whatever, it's just be like, I love that place, okay? No one is saying that you need to be a superstar mother and do like the woman in Proverbs 31. The Bible says that her children rise up and call her blessed and her husband does the same thing. The people in the courtyard, when they see her, they big up the husband and they tell the husband, man, you know, honor to you because you got the thing organized. Okay, that woman, man, she's do, she just make you right. Now, I can hear the people already say, then that man ain't going to horn she, that man going to do. Listen, we ain't talking about pop down people. We're talking about people who are both embracing the word of God and making it their life. There's no one that's perfect. The woman isn't perfect. The man isn't perfect. But in this scenario here, I'm saying the woman does her part and the man does his part too. Okay. We're not talking about a man that is wayward and doing foolishness. The moment you get into marriage, there's always that risk. The risk that the man does foolishness, the risk that the woman does foolishness. If we always are thinking negative, 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 you will never get what it is that God had intended for us to get. God is saying, I know there's good and I know there's bad in the earth, but I'm telling you, choose good. He's telling the man to choose good. He's telling the woman to choose good. Okay? So, you don't have to do it like how I'm saying. You don't have to stay home and, and be a superstar mom. You could go out there and lend your energy and your wisdom and your best years and your best hours to some external cause. And when you come home, you could be tired, exhausted, not in a mood to serve your husband, not in a mood to hear them kids. Only God knows what them little children was learning at school. I was watching some TikToks the other day or some Instagram or whatever. And this girl came on crying, talking about how the little children in her class are asking her for Sexy Red's Pound Town song and Ski Yee or whatever. Okay. And she's saying, these are five-year-old children, right? And she's saying, I don't know how these children know about these things and why they will be asking me for these things. If you don't pay attention to your children, they can learn them things and they could get corrupted at a very early age. Nobody is saying that you need to devote your life to your children, your husband and your family. You could do whatever you want at the end of the day, right? All I'm saying is don't let feminism tell you that that's a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a wonderful thing. Furthermore, a wise woman can, while she's maintaining the house in spectacular fashion, she can still do some sort of side business, online business, weekend business, have the children be involved in the business, right? I was watching a documentary the other day. I probably mentioned this before, but it was talking about these Jewish people in New York and that type of thing. These are some rich people, right? And they were basically speaking about how the children come up, okay? And by the time the boy is 13, he's supposed to know accounting at all. And he's supposed to be able to deal with finances in the companies. 13. By the time the girls are 12 or around the same age, they're supposed to know how to do all the kosher food, 
And they're supposed to be well-trained in what's going on when it comes to making sure that the family is properly nourished. Among other things, I can't remember all the details in the documentary, but I know that those people were wealthy, well-off, and they value family, and they value the, the role that the woman has to play. A homemaker is not a trivial job. Now, if in your mind a homemaker is somebody that the man is along, she stay home, do the minimum, sit down and watch bare soap operas and barely scrub a little something, and don't be really thinking about how to orchestrate the family and to plan trips and to plan education and to, if if you're talking about that sort of woman that's just idle, well, I mean, I don't advocate for that either. Try and go and get a job, <laughs> cause you ain't doing nothing. You ain't doing nothing home. You ain't helping nobody. You ain't doing nothing good for yourself or for the children or for your husband. But you should not think that managing your house and your household and your children is a bad thing, a small thing, a trivial thing, right? This is big stuff, okay? Now, I quickly want to just jump into 1 Peter chapter 3, starting from verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you be of one mind. Having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Okay, and we can go on. But again, we have Peter here speaking about husbands and wives, and then he goes on to the general 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. So instead of somebody do you evil, you do them evil back. He say, no, if somebody does you evil, your husband, your wife, your next door neighbor, whoever it is, if somebody does you evil, do them good. Do something that is a blessing to that person. That's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5. Bless those that curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. This is the God mind. This is the higher thinking. God is trying to pick us up from the bottom. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Vex for you. You do me something bad, I can do you something bad. But God is trying to pull us up from there. He says, look. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says to the woman, be submissive to your husbands, even if the husband isn't a good one, right? Let's read it again. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. In other words, you see, we got to read these words and we got to understand what they're meaning. He says that even if some do not obey the word, that sounds simple. But that means when a man is not obeying the word, that means he's not 
under God's rule, which means he doing as he like, which means he might be horning and she, which means he might be gambling, which means he might be drinking. All sorts of things could fall under those simple words, even if some do not obey the word. He could be doing the most in there. And Peter is saying, hey, be submissive to that husband, <laughs> right? That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. In other words, this wretched man that is your husband, who is not very good, when he sees the excellent conduct of his wife and how undeserving he is of her, Peter is saying, look, that man might very well change and be converted to God simply by the stellar performance of his wife under the conditions that he's put her in. Nobody wants to be in those conditions. I am not wishing that for you. I'm not saying to you, go and find yourself a difficult husband to go and live under. I'm not saying that. I suggest strongly that you be prudent and careful about who you choose to marry and hinge yourself to. You should be very cautious. You should be very careful. You should be very deliberate. You should pray about it and you should make a good decision. I suggest that you also, especially if you're younger, you should try to get some counsel with some older people. Hopefully they're properly educated and they're not biased and they could also help you in pacing yourself and making the right decision at the right time. Okay? Try to find a good husband. But what Peter is saying here is that if you find yourself in a situation where you had a bad husband, he's still saying, be the best wife. Be the best wife. But back to my original point here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good, and are not afraid with any terror. Peter is here saying that Sarah obeyed her husband. I mean, they got some women that if they hear that, their eyes will start to bulge and they will start to vomit and convulse and shake and quake and all sorts of things because that just sounds like the worst thing that could possibly happen. Not only did she obey, but she called him Lord. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I mean, these kind of things are so foreign to our lives because of feminism and modern society and so on. But Let's just take it back to God's ideal plan. In God's ideal plan, the man is a good man. The man is a diligent man, a disciplined man, a man that is following God's plan and is attending to meaningful, proper, productive business. Okay? He's doing the will of God and God is with him. And that man is a representative of God on the earth. And that man is blessed, okay? And that man is operating in integrity and righteousness. And that man is going to love his wife and put her in the proper position, in the order of things. He's going to honor her, as Peter says here. He's going to provide for her, protect her, all of these things, okay? So that man is worthy of love. That man is worthy of obedience. That man is worthy of submission. That man is worthy to be called Lord or to be exalted or bigged up, if you want to call it in a more modern term. Even if you think deep down inside of your heart, if you came across a man that was excellent in everything, okay? Now, the excellence of a man and how you perceive it is going to be, is going to be largely based on your perception. They got some women that for them, an excellent man is a man with enough money. He's six feet tall. He's handsome and good looking. And he's got a nice smile and a laundry list of superficial things, right? Well, I know that you can't ignore the superficial things altogether. But just for a moment, just think about the, an excellent man. Not only beautiful and rich and well-to-do in physical, material things, but also excellent in character. 
in wisdom, in judgment, in competence, and all of those things. Imagine such a man. Most women that have their head on, and even those that don't have their head on, naturally fall in line and naturally want to submit to that type of man and naturally want to serve that type of man, especially if that man is hers. Most women would easily or far easier submit to such a man. Okay, well, in God's divine plan, that's how the man is. And in God's divine plan, the woman is supposed to respond to the man likewise. In our pop-down reality, <laughs> the man is not quite there. And the woman is not quite there. But God is saying, go lean towards the ideal. Lean towards the ideal. Sometimes you can be leaning towards the ideal better than your husband. And sometimes your husband is going to be leaning towards the ideal better than you. But God is saying, forgive one another, be courteous, be gentle, be patient, love one another, submit to one another. We can work it out, we can work it out, we can work it out. Okay, but if you don't have the ideal crystal clear in your mind, it's going to be hard for you to aim at it. And if you're not aiming for the ideal, it means you're aiming for something else. And if you're aiming for the pop down divisive world that the devil has offered us, well, then you will more than likely end up in some sort of tragic divorce. God says going to the marriage no longer as two people but one. The devil and feminism and that pop down system says, don't put your money in a boy account, right? That money is your money. The devil says, don't be dependent upon the man for the money. Call when he ready, he can left you. At the beginning, of the, before you can even get in the marriage, the devil is teaching you distrust and skepticism. Be skeptical of what he can You don't know what he can do. Right? The worst kind of ideas in your mind and likewise in the man. How are you going to get a decent God-honoring marriage when you come in with bogus concepts that God ain't had nothing to do with? That the devil himself put in your head through modern day feminism and all that garbage. You follow what I'm saying? So I don't want to take it too much further. I just want to say this here. James chapter 1, the Bible says, Look, let every man be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to hear. Okay? Proverbs chapter 9 says, Look, a wise man, when he receives correction or instruction, he's going to be happy about it. He's going to receive that instruction. He's going to enjoy that instruction because he wants to improve his life, right? I'm saying to you, I'm telling you what to do. I'm not forcing you down any path. I'm just saying to you, look, consider what the Bible is saying here, okay? Don't listen to the Bible through the ears of modern feminism. Let God say what he wants to say. And listen to God and say, okay, what is God saying about? Okay? Meditate on these things. And give God's way a try. Don't be so quick to shut off when you hear the words submit or obey or anything like that. Don't be so quick to shut off. At least let your mind entertain the ideal and receive the word of God. And then see, how can I get this done? Invite the way and the thinking of God into your life and allow God's way and word and thinking to shape your mind, your speech, and your behavior and see if your life is going to be different. Okay? I wanted to look at some other things tonight, but I'm not going to do that because it will take us far too long. And we had better look at that another time. But I hope that this clarifies some things and that you would be open to another way of thinking, open to a divine suggestion, a divine command in some instances, in most instances, and embracing 
the God way. Because God is not asking women to be submissive and humble only. God is humble. Jesus is submissive. The king of the universe. The Bible says, Philippians chapter 2, we looked at it sometime back. The Bible says that Jesus, when he found himself in fashion as a man, he became obedient. He became humble and humbled himself under God and did whatever God wanted him to do, even to death, even not a regular death, but the death of the cross, an excruciatingly painful death. Jesus says, I'm going to submit to God's leading. Okay? Submission is part of the kingdom of God. When we as men, God gives us the authority in our households. Fine, no problem. But we, we need to submit to Christ. <laughs> we need to submit to God. We can't do as we like. We need to submit to God. We are not free to do as we like and to push around and to boss around this. And to, we need to submit too. Ain't nobody getting away from the submit. Submit is the natural course of God's culture. Submission, love, gentleness, preferring one another. You will see Paul say in the Bible, let every man think on the other man's things and not on his things only. That's the way of God. It's not just for the women to submit. Everybody is submitting. First Peter chapter 5. Yeah, all of you be submissive to one another. Okay, so the world is not like that. And that's why when you hear these things, it sounds naive. It sounds foolish. It sounds unrealistic. It sounds like, oh, but you see, if you're trying to build a Christian family on Christian values and you're trying to erect this thing, and you have a woman or a man that is not trying to use these same principles, but they're still trying to live by the world, well, it's going to be very difficult. Okay, I remember a time I had liked this female. You know, I like her on the external, but her mind was so world-focused that nothing I said would make sense to her. It, ain't, it don't make no sense because I care about them things, right? I care about the money. I just want the money, boss. I'm interested in all that Jesus thought. Now, these type of people, they would put in their bio that they're Christians or that they're spiritual or some, something to that effect. And they would claim that they're Christians and they would go to church. Okay? But the fact of it is that they're not interested in the things that God is asking them to do. It's almost as if, I, I don't know how to say it, but Basically, they are not interested in living the way that God says to live. They're still operating as a child of the world and a child of the devil. They're still using and leaning heavily on satanic concepts of independence. And let me gather all today and let's go back to Egypt and get this thing fixed because I ain't seeing the money. Right? Or I ain't seeing uh, light at the end of this tunnel. So I bet I divorce you, call you like you don't bring in the money. You're still operating on that. And they would prefer their man to get out of the will of God and to go and pursue money than to stay in the will of God and let God bring the money. You can't build no family on godly principles if you have a person who's already leaning towards the world, embracing the world, and trying to get you to embrace the world too. You understand? You can't do it. So, again, I'm just sharing with you the words of God. Everything I'm talking about, I'm giving you the references, I'm showing you the scriptures for yourselves. Read it for yourself, okay? And see if you want to do what God is asking us to do. Right? See if you want to adopt humility and love and care. And if you want to find a man with equal sensibility and equal desire to do the will of God and to live God's way and see if things are not better than maybe what you currently are pursuing 
or maybe what you have experienced in the past. I'm going to finish there for now. Let's just pray and let's carry on. So Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for your word. I thank you for giving us so many different references in different parts of the scripture that help us to get a fuller understanding through direct exhortation and then through stories, through proverbs, through songs, through many different ways we are able to get a full idea as to how you think about certain topics. Lord, I pray that you help us to be open to living life your way, that we would prefer to be servants and not rulers, that we would prefer to be honorable and not selfish, that we would lean in to your ideas and your heavenly culture, and we would forsake the selfish, individualistic thinking of the devil and his children and his propaganda. Help us, Father, not to be ashamed of your word. Help us not to be afraid of what others will think of us when we hold to your word. Help us not to buckle under the social pressure as they try to persuade us of their corrupt and ineffective choices and their ineffective ways of doing things. Help us to gracefully decline their offer and help us to accept your offer and to pursue the things that you ask us to pursue the way that you have asked us to pursue them. Help us to embrace humility as a people and individually. Help us to, to want that humility and not to hate it. Lord, I thank you again for all that you've done here tonight. Please let your spirit be with us and please let your will be done in our lives. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi guys, Joel Brooks here at the Insight Podcast. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video or found it informative, interesting, or helpful in any way, please give it a like and consider sharing it with your friends. If you want to stay connected, you can check us out at our website, insight.joelbrooksonline.com. And you can also check us out on social media. Links in the description below. Thanks again for watching and God bless.